The skill of the navigator is to assess the vessel's position and determine a safe course to steer. The latter can be influenced by factors such as economics, time, schedule, or weather conditions. The navigator has to collect information, evaluate it, and then make a decision. Since ancient times, man has ventured to sea, but little is known of his navigation skills. Before the introduction of the compass in Europe in the 13th century, navigators had nothing more than landmarks, sundials, and celestial bodies to determine their position. It is believed that the ancient Phoenicians used astronomical methods to find their latitude. Since the pole star, or Polaris, remains almost fixed in the celestial sky, its elevation over the horizon can easily be used to estimate the latitude. A simple piece of wood held at arm's length can be used to measure the pole star's elevation. Another method is to measure the sun's elevation at its noon meridian when it is highest. However, this method requires the use of the sun's declination tables, as it varies during the solar year. In the Middle Ages, the seaman's quadrant used the plumb line to measure the angle between the celestial body and the horizon. The astrolabe is a hanging metal ring with one or two openings which projects the sun's rays onto a scale. The cross staff, or Jacob's staff, has a right-angle transom that slides until one end sights the horizon and the other the celestial body. An improvement came in the 16th century with a back staff that sighted the sun by projecting its shadow on a vein which served as a horizon sight. It is not until the 18th century, when mirrors were added, that these instruments became the forerunners of the modern sextant. Measuring longitude is measuring the angle between the meridian at the observation site and the meridian at a reference site. Through the ages, this reference site has been the Canary Islands, Rome, Paris, and finally Greenwich in England. To find the longitude, Ancient navigators would compare the time of celestial events, such as an eclipse of the moon, with the time at the reference site. Unfortunately, accurate moon almanacs were not available. In the 17th century, a method called lunar transit was used. But difficulties in measuring the time of the moon's transit at its meridian made it both inaccurate and unreliable. A mechanical approach to finding the longitude by means of measuring time was not usable until the end of the 18th century, when an Englishman named John Harrison invented the first reliable chronometer. In 1493, Christopher Columbus sailed back to Spain, only knowing the latitude of his destination, and sailing along this line until meeting land. He evaluated his longitude only by dead reckoning, that is, logging the distance sailed every day. Sailing by dead reckoning requires continuous measurement of the course and speed of the vessel. From the ancient Greek to the Norsemen, navigators wrote sailing directions like Sail westward, keeping these two mountain tops aligned, until you meet again seabirds then turn north until land appears on the horizon. If this failed, they were lost at sea. In the 15th century, Europe expands and sea trade flourishes. In northern Europe, the Hansa League controls the sea and their sailors measure distances along coastal water by noting, with the help of a time glass, the time it takes to cover certain distances. Early nautical charts were quite inaccurate, mostly due to the fact that longitude was difficult to assess. Often charts were drawn with exaggerated notion boundaries. The French king, Louis XIV, is said to have complained that he lost more land to his map surveyors than at war. We know that in the first century BC, 
Alexandria had a lighthouse. The Hercules Tower, built by the Romans, can still be seen in La Coronia, Spain. It is one of the world's oldest lighthouses. The oldest record of sea marks is from Bruges, Belgium, where the constantly silting seaways of the Hansa town was marked as a buoyed channel with floating barrels.